Well, I hope you enjoyed that little video that Jeff put together with our Serve the World staff and um, Pastor Bruce McAvoy. Uh, we've been involved in Ecuador for a long time as a church, and it means a lot to me personally because three of my four sons have served right at those places in El Refugio on mission trips. Three of them were baptized there as they served. I was there a couple of summers ago and got to see firsthand not just the camp area, but that skate park church. It's just an awesome thing to see, and you, you as a church family have had a huge part in making that happen through your generosity and your prayer, so thank you so much for being a part of Serve the World. Well, I want to start the message today with um, a kind of blink word association. We're using that phrase blink a lot now just to get initial reaction. Don't overthink it. Don't th think too much at all. Just give me a blink of the eye reaction. I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to say the first thing that comes to your mind. And I only have one. It's not like a whole bunch of them, so you have one chance to do this, all right? Ready? Do you believe in miracles? Okay, what's the first thing you thought of? Hockey. hockey. Did you think of the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team? If you didn't, what's wrong with you? No. Maybe you thought about the movie that was made uh, about that hockey team called Miracle. How many of you weren't even alive in 1980? Yes, that's part of the problem. Uh, we're getting dated here. But the victory of the U.S. team over the Russian team, which actually, if you remember, was the semifinal game. It wasn't actually the gold medal game, which people misremember all the time. It became known as the miracle on ice because the, as the clock ticked down in that game, with the U.S. leading, I think, 4-3, to three, announcer Al Michaels shouted out, Do you believe in miracles? And that phrase stuck and has become iconic in our culture ever since 1980. Now here's the question I want to begin with. What is a miracle? What is a miracle? The dictionary says a miracle is an extremely outstanding or unusual event or accomplishment. An extremely unusual, outstanding event or accomplishment. But then there's another definition that says a miracle is an event manifesting divine intervention. An event that manifests divine intervention. Now, the 1980 hockey team seems to meet the first definition, an outstanding or unusual accomplishment, but not so much the second, divine intervention. I'm not so sure God was all that involved with a hockey game. Now, if the Cubs win, a ho whole different story. <laughs> a recent study by a group called the Pew Research Center shows that 80% of all Americans say they believe in miracles. Eighty percent of all Americans believe in miracles, and that may or may not surprise you. But the study also discovered something I thought was a little bit surprising. Among younger people, the generation called millennials, roughly those born between 1982 and 2004, and I have four of those in my house, or in my house sometimes, um, about 80 percent of them also believe in miracles. And that's only unusual because only about 25% of that generation is currently affiliated with a church or a religious group. So only 25% of them are associated with a church, or say they are, but a full 80% of them believe in miracles. I find that very, very interesting, maybe a little surprising, and I think we see some of it in the story we're going to look at today. We're in a preaching series all year long called The Story of Jesus, and currently we're in a series called Going Public. And so far we've seen in this mini-series the story of the cleansing of the temple when Jesus kicked out the money changers. We saw the late night conversation with Nicodemus when Jesus said to this very religious man, you must be born again. We saw the conversation, a surprising, shocking conversation between Jesus and a Samaritan woman at the well in Sychar when he offers her living water. We saw John the Baptist say of Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. I have my little wristband on here that Jeff gave me. You might, might, you might have one as well. And today we come to a story about a miracle. I want to read it for you all the way through, like we've been doing, and then we'll go back sort of uh, verse by verse and understand it more deeply. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 46. You can look on the big screen behind me or on your Bibles, or you can just listen. So he, Jesus, came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. 
The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Now you need to know here before we begin that whenever John the Apostle, the writer of the Gospel, says and uses the word sign, he means by that what we mean when we say miracle. It's a supernatural event caused by the direct intervention of God. That's what John means by sign. The first sign in his gospel was in chapter 2, the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. This is the second sign or miracle. So now let's dig in. John writes, so he, Jesus, came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. I want to put up on the screen again a map of ancient Israel. We've been doing this sort of week by week. I hope you can see this clearly enough to see, but let me take you through it. The Dead Sea is to the south, that sort of long body of water, and it's connected via the Jordan River all the way to the Sea of Galilee in the north. But the southern region there, uh, where the Dead Sea is, includes Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem, if you can read it, you probably can't because it's printed, kind of, it's kind of uh, blurry, is about 20 miles directly west of the Dead Sea. And then if you go north from there, 65 to 70 miles or so, roughly here to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, you see the Sea of Galilee. That's a smaller body of water toward the north. And up there is where Jesus' hometown was, Nazareth, where he grew up. Now, this whole region, you'll see, is not a gigantic region of territory. The entire story of Jesus' life takes place in an area roughly the size of New Jersey, about one-sixth the size of the state of Illinois. This is not a big area. Now, let me trace for you where Jesus has been through this series that we've been doing called uh, going public, the public phase of his life and ministry. We started in Cana, which is a small town up just west of uh, the Sea of Galilee, close to Nazareth. It's only about four miles away from Nazareth, where Jesus turned water into wine. Then Jesus, the Bible says, went up to Jerusalem. Now on our map, it's down, it's south, but in terms of topography, it's up because Jerusalem is located at elevation. So it says he goes up to Jerusalem, south on the map, for Passover, where he throws the money changers out of the temple. Remember that story. And then he has the late night conversation with Nicodemus right there around Jerusalem, near the Dead Sea in that region. Then uh, he hears the religious leaders are beginning to uh, uh, become restless about his growing popularity, so he decides to go back north now. He's going to traverse the, south to north, uh, the whole nation, and he decides to walk straight through Samaria. Remember, that was a little bit unusual because usually Jews would walk around Samaria. He goes straight through, ends up stopping at the well, has this amazing conversation with the Samaritan woman, uh, and we are told that he stays there for a couple of days, and many of the Samaritans put their faith in him as Messiah. Now he finishes his journey by continuing north to Cana, which is very near to Nazareth in the region of Galilee. So he's back close to home where people would remember him as Mary and Joseph's boy and a lot of those strange stories surrounding his birth, which were still probably circulating around. So John continues, and at Capernaum, uh, there was an official whose son was ill. Now I want to give you another map here. It's a little closer up, and I want you to look at that green area at the top. At the green area at the top, you'll see the Sea of Galilee just to the right there, and just touching the Sea of Galilee is the city called Capernaum. You see Cana just off to the west and Nazareth just off to the south. It's a really small little area. Not quite like the Tri-Cities, but small like that. Uh, Capernaum is the city just to the north, and it's about 15 miles northeast of uh, Nazareth and Cana. Now, this is the view today. If you were, were at Capernaum, where ancient Capernaum used to be, and you're looking out of the Sea of Galilee, that's what it would look like. Now, in case you're wondering, the Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long and about 9 miles wide. Now, how big is that? Just for perspective, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, is about three miles wide and nine miles long. So if you think of the Sea of Galilee, it's not quite twice as large as Lake Geneva. It's called a sea, but it's really kind of like a large lake. And if you're standing there, you can see right to the other side, this is where all this stuff is happening. Now, Capernaum is believed to be the hometown of the Apostle Peter. 
which makes sense because we know he was a fisherman along with several others of the early disciples. Uh, and archaeologists have t discovered what they believe to be the ruins of Peter's house in ancient Capernaum. Now this is the site. You can see ruins of the walls. Notice what the walls of these ancient uh, homes were built of. These are stone rock walls. It wasn't built out of lumber and drywall and stuff. It was stones. Jesus, as you remember, was called a carpenter, but the word in Greek is tekton. And in that time, it would have been understood as more of a builder than just a carpenter. We think of a carpenter as sometimes someone only makes like small tables and things. Jesus would have understood how to build houses like this. He was a builder. Now see the larger builder, building in the back? That building is built directly over what scholars believe to be the ruins of Peter's actual house. You can look right through a plexiglass floor and see the ruins. And it's quite likely, and this is what is really amazing when you're there, that Jesus actually slept in that house when he visited his dear friend Peter, because Jesus didn't have a home in Capernaum, but Peter did. So we imagine disciple sleepovers right down there in the, those stone walls. Now, the official in this story that John talks about is also from Capernaum. His office was probably in another city called Tiberias, which I'll talk about in a minute, but he had a home in Capernaum. Now, who was this official? A literal translation of the word John uses is royal one, and it indicates that this man was connected to a king in some way, very likely in service of the local king of the region, Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas was a bad guy. He was the son of Herod the Great, the guy who tried to kill the baby Jesus shortly after he was born and killed lots of other infants on the way. Uh, Herod Antipas, his son, was one of at least four sons, and he was also called Tetrarch. That word just means he was king over a fourth, because Herod the Great divided his uh, kingdom up and gave each one of his sons a, a, a part of it, so none of them would be as powerful as he. But this is Herod Antipas, who eventually built him, himself a city called Tiberias after the, the Roman emperor, although it was really a city for himself, on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, Antipas was a wicked man. He married his brother's wife, and when John the Baptist eventually called him out for that great sin, he had John the Baptist arrested and eventually had him beheaded and executed. So this is Herod Antipas. He eventually plays a role in the trial and execution of Jesus himself, at that time in the story, which we'll get to in the spring. So this official, who served in the administration of Antipas, would most definitely fall in what I would call the unlikely category in terms of people who would ever be interested in following Jesus. Unlikely category. And Jesus would have had many reasons to be wary of this man, but something very surprising happens here. Verse 47, John tells us, When this man, with all that background, hears that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus has evidently been in the area long enough for word to spread that he's back home. Now, we know by this time, just four chapters into John's Gospel, that there are already a number of different opinions about Jesus and who he was. They're all swirling around. Some leaders in Jerusalem already thought he's a troublemaker a false teacher, a false prophet, and they were starting the wheels turning to get rid of him. There were those who said he was a prophet, like John the Baptist out in the wilderness. Others said he's just a miracle worker. And still others thought he was the Messiah of God. Many Samaritans came to believe, John has just told us. So people are still probably talking about him, talking about the unusual thing that happened at the wedding a while back. Nobody really knows, but there's rumors about that. And all of this is important to this man, why? Because he has a sick son. Now, I think we would all agree that there is maybe no desperation greater than the desperation that a parent feels when a child is sick, very sick. A few years ago, uh, one of our boys, when he was about 10 or so, started developing just, just odd symptoms. Uh, he he kind of stopped eating. He wasn't hungry. He would take two bites and say he was, felt full. He would be overcome with fatigue at weird times when he shouldn't be. And he started to lose weight. Uh, so our 10-year-old lost about 15% of his body weight in nine months. 
And we took him to our pediatrician. He didn't know what it was. He, maybe he needs more sleep. No, he's sleeping 10 hours a night. That's not the problem. Took him to a specialist in Chicago. Well, maybe he's depressed. No, we, we knew it, it wasn't something like that. We took him to at least three or four specialists, and no one knew, and he, yet he continued to lose weight. He wasn't himself. People were starting to ask us, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's happening? He's lost so much weight. Well, eventually, through some contacts here at FECG, we got him into Mayo Clinic. Had him up there for five days, and on the fourth day, they diagnosed him with something called POTS, POTS for short. It's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and I'll never forget how to pronounce those words because it was our son who had it. It was treatable with salt and water, salt and water, and in two weeks he was fine and it never came back. But I remember the desperation. What if we can't find out what it is? What if nobody finds out what it is? What's happening to our son? This man is desperate, and in his desperation, he does something that for him had to be incredibly humbling. He seeks out, and it took him a 20-mile ride on a horse, 15 to 20 miles to get there. He seeks out not a rabbi from the local synagogue, not a priest from the temple in Jerusalem, not an elite physician of the time, which he could have afforded, but he seeks out a former carpenter-turned-prophet rumored to have extraordinary powers who already had some very powerful people in Jerusalem upset at him. He seeks him out. He comes to Jesus, who's actually cousin of John the Baptist, the prophet who would soon confront his boss with his own sin, and his boss would have him executed. He comes to Jesus. Think of the risk this would have been for this man. It's an extraordinary thing for him to do. Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. So Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. Now, if you're paying attention, this is an extraordinary little interaction. It's the heart of the story, and it's fascinating. Now, our first instinct is to jump ahead to the miracle. Jesus says, Your son will live. Oh, let's go to that. Let's go look at the miracle. That, that's what I really want to see. And we're going to get there, but not right away. And here's why. Notice that before Jesus offers this gift of healing, he offers a rebuke. We can't miss this. There's a rebuke here. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Why does he say this? What does he mean by that? This is actually a theme we see throughout the Gospels. The theme is when Jesus seems reluctant to use his power and authority to do the miraculous. Scripture tells us that at times he's reluctant because he knows that people will focus on the miracle and not on the point of his coming. Earlier in John 4, in fact, the verses just before the story we read here today, we read in verses 43 to 45, after the two days he left for Galilee, so he's on his way back home. John adds, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they had also been there. So they saw the things that he had done. They welcomed him, but Jesus says, they will not give me honor. See what he's saying? Put it all together. Jesus is saying that when he returns to his hometown, he will not be welcomed there for who he really is. They want to see the tricks. They want to see him do some cool things, but they will not receive him as Messiah, as Son of God. Might be because they're just a little too familiar with him. You know, isn't that Mary's boy? Didn't he used to be the carpenter? Might be because they're more interested in entertainment than repentance. And he, tends, he knows that people, just by our nature, tend to prefer miracles to transformation. Here's how I would say it. He knows, and I'll include us in this story, he knows that we have a tendency to turn faith into magic. And here's what I mean by that. We turn faith into magic when we live as if God doesn't exist or isn't particularly important until we have a particular need for him. We live as though Jesus doesn't matter to us very much until we need him to do something important for us. We turn faith into magic when we, when we think, well, if I do this for him, if I fill in the blank, if I serve, I, if I go on a mission trip, if I give enough money, if I go to church, then he'll do something for me. We turn it into a transaction. 
Now, part of this is just being human. We struggle with faith. But part of it is we are kind of drawn to a magical kind of faith. Faith that is part superstition, part egocentric. It's about us, about me. And this is not the transforming faith Jesus wants for us. So he says to the crowd probably gathered to watch to see what he'll do, you will not believe unless you see signs and wonders. He's warning against what I would call utilitarian faith. You know, I believe in you and love you as long as you do things for me. That was essentially Satan's argument against God back in the book of Job. Remember that? You remember the story? Maybe you haven't studied the book of Job lately. Let me just summarize it for you. Satan has been roaming to and fro on the earth. God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him in all the earth. Worships, worships me upright among all the men in the earth. Have you considered Job? Satan says to God, he only serves and worships you because you've blessed him with such abundance. Let me take away his things, his stuff. He'll curse you to your face. In other words, Satan says, Job only loves you, only worships you because you pay him to, God. And the rest of the story is Satan attacking Job over and over again through pain and loss and suffering, trying to destroy his trust in God. We'll come back to Job at the end of the message. I think this is what Jesus is warning us about, that our faith is sometimes based on how blessed we are instead of who God is. And there's a difference. For example, often our first thought when someone we love is sick, in my family, for example, when our son was sick, our first thought is to pray. To pray and to ask for, <coughs> excuse me, and even beg for healing. And that's understandable. As a staff, we pray every week for concerns you turn in. We pray every week for people. This past week, we prayed for people. And we ask God for healing. We ask Him for all kinds of things. We do ask Him for healing. But, and this is the point Jesus is making, we don't always have that same desperate faith that we do when we need healing, for example, and when it comes to other parts of our spiritual lives. Let's say obedience in worship. Let's say faithfulness in generosity. Let's say forgiving one who has wronged us, or let's say loving those who disagree with us. We don't have that same desperate faith then, but we have it when we need something from him. See, sometimes I think we want the miracle without the worship, without the obedience. And this is the point Jesus is making. We want miracles without being part of what God is doing in the world. Remember the young generation, don't associate with the church, but believe in miracles. See, sometimes we use God for our purposes rather than off ourselves for his purposes. So Jesus rebukes the crowd that's gathered to watch him do a trick. And this man then, to his credit, perhaps understandably, is persistent. He says, sir, come down before my child dies. And now we see another surprise. Jesus says, go, your son will live. Now, a slightly more literal translation is, go, your son lives. It's the present imperative. And when you say it that way, it packs a little more punch. Now, I know it's the Bible, and I know we sort of expect miracles in the Bible, but let me show you why this is a surprise. First, it's a surprise because we have every reason to believe that this man, this official, is not yet a follower of Jesus. There's no indication that he is. We only know he's connected to a king, probably Herod Antipas, a wicked man. He probably would have been seen as a secular Jew in his day, maybe even considered more of a Roman than a true Jew. Jesus had every reason to question this man's motives. Jesus knew who he worked for. He, knew, he had every reason to say, hey, why don't you just go back to your boss and tell him not to mess with my cousin? He could have said that, but he doesn't. Second, it's surprising because Jesus has just said that he's not interested in miracle faith. He's not interested in signs and wonders just to, to entertain people. So why does he respond to this man's desperate plea? Well, the first answer, I think, is, is simple. It's just grace. Jesus responds out of his grace. He responds out of love. Jesus doesn't demand religious performance before offering the gift of his grace. He just wants faith and trust. Second, and this is the key, Look at what this royal official does next. 
The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. We can almost miss that. This is a man used to giving orders. He's a man familiar with power. He's used to having people serve him. So he comes to Jesus, comes all that way, humbles himself, makes this desperate request, asks Jesus to come to his home and heal his son. And Jesus says, go on your way. Your son will live. And he just goes. He doesn't demand. He doesn't ask again. No, I, no can you just come? Can you just come with me? I'll, I have a horse right here. Just come with me. He doesn't demand to see the miracle. He doesn't get upset that Jesus isn't doing exactly what he says. He believed Jesus at his word. Before the miracle happened, Jesus' word was enough. See, I think the point of this little interaction is not really the healing of the son. It's the transformational faith of the father in trusting Jesus at his word. We've all heard the saying, seeing is believing. And there is some truth to that. When the first news of the resurrection came, again, we'll cover the story in the spring, both Peter and John hear, and then they run to the tomb and look in to see for themselves, right? Seeing is believing. When Thomas hears, he says, unless I see and touch, I won't believe. That seeing is believing. This man believes without seeing. So now we see there are two miracles in the story. Verse 51, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, which had been about one in the afternoon, in our way of thinking about time. The fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. Now this is the first miracle. The official finds that his son is recovering. The fever's broken. The boy's been healed. Next, he finds out that healing took place at the exact moment when this this former carpenter spoke the words, your son lives. So Jesus has the power and authority to change the condition of that boy's body from 15 miles away over a distance by simply speaking a word. The man has to ask, what kind of man is that? It's confirmation of the one in whom he had placed his faith. And for John, this is the sign of, in which we see the glory of God in Jesus. So, okay, we get that part of it. But then we get to what I think is actually the greater miracle of the story. And he himself believed and all his household. And this now is the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Remember, we are saying as we go through the story of Jesus that most often when Jesus performs a miracle... And this is indeed a miracle. This is divine intervention. This is a healing story. But the miracle isn't the point. When he performs a miracle, the miracle is not really the point. So what's the central point of this story then? It's not the healing of the boy. That boy eventually died from something else, we can assume. It wasn't the healing of the boy. The point of the story is the authority and glory of Jesus as the Son of God. The purpose of the miracle is that this man and his whole household put their faith in Jesus. Think about it this way. If the point of the story was physical healing, if that was the point of the story, then Jesus would have healed every sick person in ancient Israel. Every sick person in the ancient world he would have healed if that was the point. But that's not what he did. He didn't heal every person in ancient Israel. He didn't heal every person in ancient um, uh, Cana or in ancient Capernaum. He doesn't heal every physical sickness or disease today. The miraculous healing of the boy points us to who Jesus is. And Jesus is the one who gives his word, gives himself, who transforms, who gives the gift of salvation That's the point. As a pastor, and all of us here at FECG have done this, but I've been in lots of hospital rooms, been in lots of hospital rooms recently, lots of emergency rooms. I've prayed with lots of hurting and desperate people who were asking God for the miracle. And I believe I've seen some healed, sometimes through gifted doctors and nurses and treatment processes and surgery. Some of those people, doctors and nurses, knew they were being used by God. Some didn't. I've seen some 
healed, I believe, through the power of the Holy Spirit in ways you can't really explain. But many, maybe even most, have not been healed, at least not physically. What then? Something wrong with our faith? Is something wrong with our prayers? Do we say it wrong? Do we do it wrong? Is there something wrong with Jesus? Does he not care? Is he not able? And many, many people get stuck right at this point. They say, how can I believe in a God who says he can heal but doesn't? I've talked to people like that. Can't believe. He says he will, he can, and he doesn't. I'm done with that God. But Jesus here wants us to understand that physical healing isn't the main point. He is the main point. Because the purpose of his coming is eternal life. He didn't come to heal our bodies. He came to heal our souls. And I believe that's why this story is here for us. Do we believe in Jesus because he does things for us? Or do we believe in Jesus because of who he is and what he promises us? Are we as desperate to know him serve him, worship him, bear witness to him as we are desperate to ask him for miracles. That's the point of the story. Let me get back to Job, most ancient part of the Bible. In the midst of Job's suffering, when he's facing round after round of Satan's attacks on his life, on his body, on his health, on his family, when Satan is waiting for Job to prove that he's right, waiting for Job to curse God to his face. This is what Job says. Job 19, verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. I think that's the point of the story. A God who is able, and yet his word must be enough. Will you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, how we thank you today for your word. We thank you for these stories that come to us through the pages of our Bibles. And they come to life when we, when we sort of insert ourselves into them. And so forgive us for sometimes loving you only for what you do for us for the things you give us instead of for who you are. We believe you have the power and the authority to accomplish the miraculous. Yes, even to heal our diseases. And for that, we thank you. Help us to see and long for the greater miracle, the healing of our souls through your death and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.